Thank you, FAST, for inviting us to speak again about our therapeutic approach, and thank you everyone who is there and virtually to listen. So my name is Joe Anderson, Associate Professor in University of California, Davis, and what we're working on is a stem cell gene therapy approach for Angelman syndrome. So my part of the talk will be on the idea and the data, and then I'll pass it off to Dr. Abedi, who will talk about uh, future clinical work. So our approach is a replacement gene therapy using insertional gene therapy where we will be inserting a functional copy of UBE3A into a patient's cells and then that functional copy of UBE3A will be expressed. The way that we deliver this functional copy of UBE3A is using a lentiviral vector this vector permanently integrates into cells, so the functional copy of UBE3A will be there for the life of the patient that gets the transplant. However, instead of directly gene modifying neurons, we are actually using the blood system, the hematopoietic system, to deliver this functional copy of UBE3A throughout the body and also in the central nervous system. Blood is found throughout the body. Immune system cells, including microglia, are found in the brain. And so if we are able to insert and then express this functional copy of UBE3A, we potentially can deliver it to all affected cells in the body. This is a standard hematopoietic tree. Uh, some lentiviral vector gene therapies nowadays, they target the adult immune cells like T cells, B cells, macrophages. But what we wanted to do to potentially give patients a one-time treatment is to genetically modify the actual blood stem cells called the hematopoietic stem cell, which is at the very top of the slide. The stem cell is found in the bone marrow. Very few circulate in the blood. And then, um, these stem cells will then make all of your red blood cells and white blood cells and immune cells for the rest of your life. We have them in our bone marrow for the rest of our lives. So if we're able to genetically modify them, transplant them back into a patient, these UBE3A expressing cells should be there for the life of the patient. So this is a simple schematic of what we actually want to accomplish. We have a UBE3A expressing lentiviral vector. We genetically modify these blood stem cells, transplant them back into the patient, and then these stem cells will generate UBE3A expressing immune cells for the rest of the patient's life. And these cells will then deliver this functional copy of UBE3A to affected neurons. To evaluate this preclinically, we developed with Jill Silverman's lab, an immunodeficient, UBE3A deficient mouse model. Uh, this is so that we can use human stem cells in the mice and so the cells don't get rejected. These mice have an immunodeficiency. There's, their T cells, B cells do not activate and do not function properly, so they do not reject the human cells that we put into these mice. And the reason why we wanted to make a mouse model like this was to skip over, well, not really skip over, but um, not be required to perform some of the bridging studies uh, required by the FDA if we were to use mouse cells. And so we can actually use human cells in this mouse model and evaluate their efficacy. And that way we're not required to perform further experiments with a large animal model either. And so what we would do is we would condition either newborn mice, two to five day old, or adult mice, six to eight weeks old, with a conditioning regimen, either a radiation for the pups or a busulfan conditioning regimen for the adult mice. We would transplant our UBE3A vector gene modified human blood stem cells into the mice. We wait eight weeks to check for engraftment of the human cells. And then once the human cells are detected in the mice, we can then look at a battery of behavioral assays. 
The reason why we wanted to look at both um, pups and adult mice is that we don't see clinical phenotypes in the, in the pup mice. Um, so we wanted to transplant them prior to seeing any clinical phenotypes. But then we also wanted to look at adult mice and transplant those mice once they started displaying clinical phenotypes. So we could see if our therapeutic approach could prevent phenotypes and if they could also rescue phenotypes. And so, like I said, once we were able to detect the human cell engraftment, uh, we then transferred these mice over to Jill Silverman's lab and her group uh, performed the behavior assays. One of these assays is a novel open field. Uh, the mice are put into this open box with laser beam breaks that can detect horizontal and vertical activity. And so we were able to see in, so this data is showing both of the newborn transplanted mice, that's the top panel, and then the adult transplanted mice, that's the bottom panel. The y-axis is total activity, so total amount of time that the mice are moving around in this open field assay. And the mice were tested for 30 minutes. The top line of the newborn panel, it is a darkened black circle, those are the wild type mice. Uh, that's normal activity in these mice. And the line just below it in both of the newborn and the adult panels, the blue line, that's our UBE38 vector transduced cell transplanted mice. So that's our treated mice. And we can see that they behaved sim similar to the wild type mice compared to the two lower lines, which are a vehicle control. It's just a cell transplanted mice. So we wanted to see if the bone marrow transplant and just human stem cells corrected anything or if it was actually our vector and uh, expressed UBE3A. And then also UBE3A deficient mice, they don't have UBE3A expression, that's our HEP mice and um, those are just control what UBE3A deficient mice should look like. And that's just uh, you know what the mice do in there. They walk around and then the laser beam breaks they, um, they record what the mice are doing. We next performed a beam walking experiment. So if you just wanna focus on rod three, uh, the rods have decreasing diameter and harder for the mice to traverse as the rod number increases. So rod number three is the narrowest rod. And then on the y-axis, it's a latency to cross this rod. So if you just focus on rod three, because that's the hardest one for the mice to go across, the white bar in both the newborn and adult, that's our wild type mice. And then the blue bar, that's our treated mice. So you can see that the mice were just as quick going across the rod as the wild type mice when they got our uh, treatment cells. And then the other two bars to the right, those are, are the control mice that either got the cell vehicle or no cells at all. And we can see that um, the mice that were treated with our UBE3A vector transduced cells performed just as well as the wild type mice. So this was great. We next did a gait analysis and the videos here show better how we corrected the mice uh, then the next slide, which will show the data. And so that mouse on the left is a UBE3A deficient mouse. It has a wider stance. It can't keep up with the treadmill. And then this mouse on the right has our cells with the vector in it. And you can see that that mouse performs a lot better. It's able to keep up with the, with the treadmill and it doesn't get stuck on that roller. And this is the data that corresponds to it. So again, uh, newborn and adult mice, the white bar on the left is wild type and our blue bar is our treated mice. And then the two bars next to it, the grayed in one and then the shaded one, uh, those are our control vehicle and then our HEP mice that are UBE3A deficient. So it shows that the, the width of the stances and the strides is similar to wild type when we treat the mice with our vector transduced cells. Novel ob object recognition is 
in assay to see if the mice will spend time around a novel object. And so the wild type mice um, like to spend time around the novel object. And so you can see in the data, it's a little jumbled because each of these individual circles and dots are the individual mice and then the bars are the, the average of it. And so the newborn mice on the left and the adult mice on the right and the black bars in each of the group are the, are the novel object. And so you can see the blue bar on the right of our UBE through a head. So that's our cell with the vector treated mice. They spend a similar amount of time around this novel object as the wild type mice. And then that's comparative to our uh, control mice, the vehicle controls, and then the UBE 3 deficient mice. We next look at EEG in our transplanted mice. So on the left, it shows a Delta spike in Angelman syndrome patients in humans. This is normally seen. It's also seen in the UBE3A deficient mouse model. So on the right panel is the mice. And the two high peaks, those are our control mice, the ones that got the vehicle control, just the cells, and then the UBE3A deficient mice. And then the blue line is our mice that got our vector transduced cells. And so we do see, and then the, the bottom line are the wild type mice. So we do see a reversion of this delta spike back down closer to wild type. We didn't see a complete reversion, but seeing a decrease in the delta spike was definitely promising. And I should mention that all of this data was recently published earlier this year. The, the article is available and accessible online. Anyone can go and read it and check out the data. There's more data in it as well, more than what I've presented here. But together, all of this data was then put into a pre-IND package for the FDA to look at, including some safety data that's in the paper, but it's not presented here. And so we heard back from the FDA after this pre-IND submission, and we were close to being complete for an adult clinical trial. We're currently performing one additional toxicity study for that adult trial, but the FDA wanted us to perform a couple more efficacy trials for proof of benefit for a pediatric uh, clinical trial. So we are currently performing those experiments as well. So we're currently in the IND enabling stage and experimental performance for both an adult and a pediatric clinical trial for this uh, hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy for Angelman syndrome. The way that this would work, and Dr. Betty will talk more about this, is that we'll mobilize stem cells out of the bone marrow from a patient, and then we take an apheresis, just like a, a blood donation, and the, the cells will then undergo a selection process where we can select the stem cells from this apheresis uh, product because we only want to genetically modify the stem cells and not any of the other cells. And once this is ready, the patient will receive a conditioning regimen and then the gene modified cells will be transplanted into the patient uh, intravenously. The stem cells know where to home and to go back to the bone marrow so they can be transfused uh, intravenously. And so I'd like to thank everyone in my lab, uh, past and present, that's worked on this project, uh, Julie, Jolene, and Haley, and those that will be are, will and are working on the IND enabling studies. And then the data I presented here on the, the behavioral assays was performed in Dr. Silverman's lab with Anna and Nicole. And they're also working with us to perform these IND enabling studies as well. And we definitely want to thank FAST for funding this. All of the preclinical work was funded by FAST and all of the IND enabling studies are currently funded by FAST as well. So we thank you very much um, because this will definitely help get this therapy into a clinical trial. 
And so that's the part of my talk. So I'll hand it off to Dr. Betty and he'll talk to you about the, the clinical part of the future trials. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, uh, for a great presentation. So uh, uh, I'm one of the transplanters, full disclosure. I'm not a uh, neurologist, nor I know anything about Angelman itself. Uh, but I'm a transplanter. I've been doing transplant uh, for blood cancers as well as a lot of uh, gene therapies uh, for, and, and using this platform for treating many different diseases. And we'll talk about that. Uh, my job is going to be mostly on discussing about the transplant itself and uh, trying to answer some questions, comment, concerns about the transplant and how practical is this uh, for treating the patient with Angelman syndromes there. I'm a transplanter, but uh, after hearing about that treadmill price for, uh, for a mouse, I thought maybe seriously I have to change. Maybe I can make a Peloton uh, you know, for a mouse or something there. Or maybe I can work with Scott on the... Uh, on the peak studies uh, and make a lot of more money there. But anyway, so uh, for a long time, we have been trying to treat the patients. You know, medicine has been on, on forever. We are trying to manage patients. But for the first time in the last few years, you know, just like diabetes, heart problems, we never cure the disease. We just manage it. But for the, la for the last few years, now we are seriously thinking about curing some disease. And hopefully this will be one of those. And that's, you know, across all the board. So all these different diseases that we are working, uh, uh, you know, uh, and using cell and gene therapy to treat that there. We have come a long way. This has not just started. And it uh, should uh, comfort you that there's a lots and lots of work has been done so far on safety, on efficacy there. Just look at, the, for example, the uh, autologous transplant for gene therapy for the uh, immune deficiencies. For a long time, this has been going on since 1990. And it was not working, then it started working, there were some toxicity issues, and now the, you know, all the glitches on, on toxicity and uh, efficacy has been worked out, and now this is coming to the clinic there. So there is a lot of work has been done so far, and it looks very promising. And that's why it's all over the news, everybody knows about that. Two things, first, we are not creating monsters with gene therapy. So full disclosure, uh, this, is, this is one of the most regulated fields in medicine. You know, if you give a drug to a, you know, in a phase three, very regulated you know, clinical trial, you give a, a drug to a patient, uh, you know, they, uh, the FDA is asking for a year, two years maximum fo you know, follow-up on that. And then it goes to the market there. For gene therapy, they want 15 years follow-up. You don't have to wait 15 years to go to the market, but I'm just saying it's so regulated and it's so uh, and that should alleviate, again, some of the concerns originally people have about gene therapy and, and creating that. Because, number one, we are not, you know, giving these genes and changing everything you're, you know, in your body, every single gene uh, you know, in your body. It's very, very targeted. We go after, let's just say for autologous, we take the cells out of your body, we put the specific gene target there, we analyze it, make sure we haven't done any harm, and we put it back to the patients there. So again, we're not changing your whole genome or you know, doing anything crazy to that. Um, every, every talk I do about the stem cell and gene therapy, I put this there, be aware of the scams, because there's all these clinics that's really hurting that. I have to put it there. They're really hurting us uh, with uh, you know, misconceptions on the field there, and I just want to make sure we put it there. You heard about the, the whole idea of the gene therapy multiple times. I don't want to go you know, through that that much, but you heard about elegant talk uh, about the, using AAV directly delivering uh, to the patients there. You also heard about some shortcoming on that direct delivery you know, uh, with some other approach we have to do multiple times. Um, uh, but the, the cell-based delivery may be another option. I'm not saying a better option, but it is a promising option. You can use ES cells. I think we have a long way you know, to go there. But adult stem cells, they're there. And uh, most of the work here, most of the discussion here will be on adult stem cells. Again, uh, Joe explained that you know, we're using hematopoietic stem cells uh, because, number one, it's very robust. Theoretically, you need one hematopoietic stem cells to regenerate your whole 
uh, uh, you know, stem cell component of the body there. So you know, we have done those transplants before, you know, many, many years ago with uh, Peter Quinsberry and other people there. You take one stem cell from a mouse and put it in another mouse has no stem cells, and that regenerates the whole thing. So that's so robust, and it's a lifetime treatment there. So just one single stem cell. We're not going to give one single stem cells, by the way, but I'm just saying how robust that system is. And then, and then create all these cells that are coming out of that, and we can use it for different purposes there. Again, you heard about stories about bone marrow, so we collect the, uh, the cells from the patients, uh, we isolate the stem cells, we modify that by that gene therapy, depends on what, you know, what modification we can use, and then we reinfuse it. And very importantly, we have a backup. And that backup, again, for safety is really important, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So the, first, the next few slides, I want to try to persuade you that, number one, is it safe? And uh, number two, is it going to work or not? And yes, we don't have anything for Angelman for this particular approach yet, but we have many, many examples of the things, things working very successfully in other situations there. And this is just one of the, some of the examples. I, I'm not asking you to read all of those, but all of these are autologous uh, you know, gene therapy protocols for different diseases that has been either it's, it's ongoing, it's already finished some of them, and has been successfully working there. And uh, again, there's two approach, you know, there's two reasons we use these stem cells there. One is just to correct a blood disorder. Um, so let's just say, for example, you have erythrocyte problem, you have sickle cell, you have thalassemia, and it's, it's, it's abnormal, you give a gene there, for the rest of their life, they produce normal cells, or they produce cells that correct the problem there. And same as that, if you have immunodeficiencies, you don't have um, you know, B cells and K cells and other cells there, you can correct that. Or you can correct some of the monocyte macrophage disorders there, like the uh, you know, polysaccharide problems there. Immune deficiencies. Uh, this has been an issue. There are all these you know, babies born or, uh, or later adult onset forms that they just die from infections. And they are lacking one, two, three different enzymes there. Uh, and again, multiple examples of gene therapy successfully has been, uh, you know, uh, has been uh, applied using autologous gene-modified stem cells to correct the problem there. Uh, this is like a, you know, example for a skit. All of the patients are alive. All of the patients have corrected the problems there. You know, you have heard about Bubble Boy, for example. That's that's a, that's a typical example there, and it's already in science and everything. It cures the Bubble Boys there. Uh, and even you can do it in the newborns, and successfully treated that. That's the work was done with uh, Don Cohn uh, in uh, UCLA, and also in San Jude, uh, you know, was doing that. And uh, you look at the data, it's very impressive. This was eight patients there, all of them eventually corrected the problem. And just one of them didn't convert immediately, they have to give additional cells there, and that one also corrected eventually. No toxicity, nobody died of this, everybody died. And these patients were doomed to die. So again, how efficient and how uh, uh, robust the system is with uh, toxicity, uh, you know, no, no toxicity. How about the hematopoietic disorders there? You have sickle cells, thalassemia, you have all these different ones, PK inefficiency, all of those different ones there. There is a problem with the hematopoietic cells, uh, in this case, red cells, they don't produce one, and again, all of these gene therapy autologous collected uh, stem cells that were gene modified to correct the disorder there. And again, a poster chart for that is sickle cell, is going to come to the market very soon. We are working with, you know, we have clinical trials, other people have clinical trials on that right now. Uh, but, but this is disorders that have all these cells sickling and occluding blood vessels, and they have a lifetime problems there. That's very really devastating. Many of them, they die. Many of them, otherwise, they live with the pain, you know, uh, and they're very, you know, very different. They're just uh, uh, not, you know, working well with the community because of all these chronic pains and being in the hospital all the time and everything and multiple clinical trials, multiple different ways to do the gene correction, and almost all of them is working. As I said, this is going to come to the market very soon as well. Uh, another example, using autologous cells. This is our protocol, for example. Uh, I work with Joe Anderson on that. Um, these are HIV patients that we're trying to uh, modify their blood cells uh, so they become resistant to HIV, because HIV uh, affects the blood cells there, and we make them modified and and uh, uh, now they become resistant to HIV, and this is protocol ongoing, and, and it's, it's, it seems that uh, there is no toxicity so far. 
So another way to look at the you know, gene therapy using autologous stem cells is using it as a carrier to take these cells to the CNS. So instead of injecting the cells into the CNS, use this uh, to go to CNS and produce enzymes you want. Because we know all these macrophages, microglials, uh, other cells from the hematopoietic stem cells, they go to the brain. And, uh, uh, and uh, they can be reservoirs for producing enzymes that are missing in the brain there. And there are all these disorders that they're, they're working targeting stem cells, targeting hematopoietic cells for different, uh, you know, different uh, organs there, including CNS. This is just one example of one company. Uh, I'm not promoting any company, but just as one example of, again, how robust we are and how far we have gone. Um, uh, this is uh, mucopolysaccharide disorders there. Uh, uh, that, uh, you know, they have multiple gene therapy protocols go on going for different ones, and at least one of them is already approving you. Uh, that's metachromatic uh, uh, leukodystrophy, uh, a disease, again, you know, to some extent similar to Angeman. They have, uh, uh, you know, CNS problems there and the cognitive is issues. And, uh, again, these trials have been very successful. Uh, they... Uh, uh, they transduced it with a lentivirus, exactly the same uh, uh, protocol we are using there. They tra transport hematopoietic stem cells there. They gave it to the patients there, and all of them showed sim you know, improvement in symptoms. Uh, they, they start uh, you know, progressing like a normal, uh, you know, more of a normal activity there. Uh, and more importantly, we have seven and a half years follow-up on some of them and no toxicity. And I think that's, that's the take-home message here. That's... Uh, you know, Herler syndrome, um, it's, uh, it's not only a CNS, but they have multiple other issues as well. Uh, systemically, it's a really devastating, you know, problems there. And there are clinical trials for that. And it just published in November, just, just last month, New England Journal of Medicine, the result of the, uh, the clinical trials there. Everybody, first, it was safe. Nobody had any issue. They got through that. Uh, second, they, they measure the enzymes not only in the blood, but in the CNS as well. So it's working. It's going to the CNS. Very similar approach we are actually looking for. And, uh, and then I didn't put the data there, uh, but uh, there were improvement in function as well. So what is a transplant? Uh, again, your child is going to go through this. You know, uh, the word transplant comes, bone marrow transplant, everybody starts shaking here. Uh, my patients start shaking there. Uh, and says, okay, what the heck is that? Um, number one, most of the bad stories you hear is about allogenic transplant. Allogenic transplant is an absolutely different beast. You give the cells from somebody else, and that somebody else is not you, and goes to your body and creates a chimera. And a chimera, if you know, heard about chimera, that's, uh, uh, you know, that animals with the head of the, the lion and the body of a uh, cow or something. So that chimera is not normal. And because of that, these patients may have long, uh, term problems with the, uh, uh, with the, with the disease. Um, they, they have graft versus host disease, the donor cells attacking their body. They have graft rejection, the body rejecting the graft there. They have to be on immunosuppression for the rest of their life. So many of the stories you hear about allogeneic transplant is a completely different beast there. Uh, autologous transplant is your own cells. So unless you don't like yourself or something, you're not supposed to have a reaction to that. But uh, on the other hand, you have to make this in graph in your body. So you do need some conditioning. And the conditioning is right now chemotherapy or radiation for cancer patients there. Uh, we use chemotherapy. All those trials you saw, they use a form of chemotherapy. But that form of chemotherapy also is different from the form that we give to cancer patients. Because again, most of these data is from cancer patients. The chemotherapy we give to cancer patients is to get rid of a disease. So we give them a maximum tolerated dose, or almost untolerated dose. They give them a dose that uh, try to kill all the cancer cells and barely not kill the patients. For autologous transplant for uh, gene therapy, we only want to give a dose to be able to, uh, to open some space in the bone marrow so these cells they can engraft into the body. So that's a little bit different. So the dose will be less. We're not using five chemotherapy regimens at the same time to engraft. We are using one single one, and a dose is very controlled dose there. So it's a much lower dose. Um, and I'll give you an example. In our center, for example, for a cancer, for a myeloma, we do autologous transplant. Our mortality is 0.5%. But remember, those are patients 70, 80 years old, have multiple comorbid issues, 
and uh, they already have cancer, and they have already got a bunch of chemotherapy before. So even with that, that's safer than just a simple appendix surgery. Uh, in a gene therapy, again, it's a very different story. These you know, kids or early adults we are looking at, they're much younger, they're much robust, they don't have liver or heart or lung issue, they didn't have a cancer before, and that's why all those data I showed you before, the toxicity is you know, tolerable. It's not like uh, you know, uh, the horror stories you hear about the, the cancer, for example, getting to the transplant, and especially allergenic transplant. And it's not something we just invented yesterday. So we are doing, uh, you know, this is 2015. We're doing 14, 15,000 transplant, autologous transplant in the US, and another 40,000 in, in, uh, uh, in Europe and other countries there. So it's something every day we do a, you know, autologous transplant in our patients there. Again, for cancer, most of them, 95% of them are for cancer there. And these are all different uh, cancers we're treating. This group, when we use autologous transplant for autoimmune disorders or genetic disorders, it's just a very small minority of our patients. Most of our uh, patients are cancer patients, and it's still they're doing OK. Um, and the age is anything zero to, uh, to 80 years old. So if 80 years old can tolerate that, uh, I'm, I'm really hoping uh, a much, much younger population can easily tolerate that as well. Many of them, as I said, they have comorbid issues. They have diabetes, they have heart problems, they have other things there. And many of them already have damaged hematopoietic cells and it's still working there. Again, we expect in, in a patient with Angelman syndrome to have absolutely normal hematopoietic cells. So what's the process? This is old time when we go to the OR and go 20 times on each side of the hip and trying to you know, collect a half a gallon of bone marrow uh, for, the, for the stem cell transplant. That's old times there. It's much more humane now. You can see the guy's smiling a little bit now. Uh, so we're connecting basically a vein. Um, if if uh, your patient has a good, uh, our patients have a good veins, we just connect the regular vein. If not, we put a catheter and connect it to a machine. Looks like a dialysis machine. Uh, the patient is sitting there watching TV or, or, or playing on a uh, you know, game, and the machine collects that. Usually it takes a few hours, and it's done. We store them, and the, uh, these are basically uh, you know, bone marrow samples, I mean, preferably bloody collected samples there. We store them in liquid nitrogen, not my freezer, and then we give them chemo. And that's the chemo I told you. Uh, that's the uh, conditioning chemotherapy. It's usually a few days of Again, lower dose of chemo or just one, do one type of chemo versus our cancer patients getting multiple doses. And this is just one time process. And then patients receive their stem cells. Uh, this is just hanging like a blood, basically, uh, uh, you know, if you're getting blood transfusion, you're just hanging in there and it goes, he's still smiling, so that's a good sign. Uh, what happens here? Uh, we give a chemo because we want to get rid of some of at least your stem cells to be able to open up space for the new stem cells to go in. Uh, otherwise, they're just going to be hanging, they don't have a space, and they're going to die off, and we don't want that to happen. So we need that space there. So because that chemo will kill some of the stem cells, your body is not producing enough blood cells for, for you know, a short period of time. And then after that, the stem cells we gave, now they start producing. So because of that, you know, you have a normal blood counts here. These are red cells, white cells, and, and platelets. It goes down and then starts coming down. And this is roughly about 10 to 12 days. Um, and uh, in pediatrics, it's even, you know, sometimes it's even shorter. Uh, but again, roughly 10 to 12 days. Uh, and that's where we need follow-up on them. They are usually staying in the hospital, even in the cancer center. Sometimes we do it as an outpatient. Uh, just, again, just say that. You know, it's not like, okay, they're going to be in critical, you know, uh, condition or something. So we do transplant for, you know, myeloma, for example, routinely our patients there, and they just come every day and check and, and think. But for any clinical trials, we'd rather just keep them in-house, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, they stay, uh, you know, for a few days of chemo, then roughly 10 to 12 days to get their uh, counts back. They may need a few transfusions. If they're too low, if they're not too low, we don't transfuse. If they're too low, we transfuse red cells and, and platelets. Um, so they may get you know, a couple of units of transfusions there. Uh, we don't transfuse white cells, and that's why, again, the observation is important, because when your white cells are low, you can get fever. If you get fever, they have to get antibiotics right away. We'd rather to keep them there. 
what's the chance of the getting any fever? Probably about 20%, 30% in this type of populations there. In cancer patients, it's very different because they have already have a bad, very bad immune system. Uh, and then they recover. And for pediatrics, the recovery is like amazing. They, you know, even our cancer patients, pediatric cancer patients, uh, you know, a few days after the, you know, their discharge, they look completely fine. The uh, adults, especially older patients, anytime you put somebody in the hospital, older patients, 70 years old, 80 years old, they deconditions, they have to recover. Pediatrics, they don't have that problem there. So what's the side effect there? Um, stem cell mobilizations, when you put that uh, patient on that machine, sometimes the potassium goes down, the calcium goes down, your calcium goes down, you get Tums. Uh, your potassium goes down, you get potassium supplements. Uh, sometimes we give a hormone for, uh, for the stem cells to come to the blood, so we don't collect from the bone marrow, we collect it from the blood. That will cause occasional some aches and pains. It's like you have a cold, but you don't have a cold. Um, the chemotherapy is typical chemotherapy. Nausea, diarrhea, hair loss. But, you know, we are much, much better. You know, let's just say 15 years ago when I was doing this, 20 years ago, our patients were sick as a dog, um, but they were vomiting and everything else. We have much less of that issue now. Our treatments are much better in controlling these things there. Um, and again, the type of chemotherapy is very toned down comparing what we give a cancer patients there. Uh, so we expect, uh, you know, a very robust, again, pediatric especially, pediatric population, it's much, much more tolerant than 80 years old. Um, and then I talk about anemia, low platelets, and low white cells there, that those are the, those are reasons we keep the patient in-house to give them, uh, if they need, they give a transfusion, if they don't need transfusion, it's fine. Uh, and if they have a fever, we give them antibiotics. If they no, don't have a fever, that's fine. But that's where we are going now. I, I think Allison explained that very elegantly. Um, this is just a typical drug, um, uh, you know, drug discovery, five, you know, 5,000 to 10,000 takes uh, 10 years to get here to be able to continue. You get one drug, and even that one drug later may fall apart. So this landscape has changed substantially with cell and gene therapy. Now FDA approved a gene therapy after very, very few patients. So, you know, as as you know, small as you know, 20, 30 patients may get approved with the FDA, and they have told us that they are interested to doing that if there is an earth shattering things there. And if it doesn't work, we can immediately go back to the lab and modify the things there. And we have done that for multiple gene therapies. So we're really hoping that this can go very fast and get to uh, uh, our patients soon. As Joe was explaining, uh, uh, we have already gone through all of these things there. And that's usually the biggest time consuming area to, uh, to develop this. Now we are already done the pre-IND. And we are uh, responding to IND questions there before we go to the uh, phase one, uh, and we hope it's going to be very, very soon. And this is, you know, right now, that's just hypothetical. That's where we're going to go. We're going to go with six adults and six children. The reason for adults there is uh, the FDA wants us to try the adults. You know, not that, you know, adults are, or pediatrics are more important than adults and vice versa, but that's FDA and I don't have any control on that. Um, so we're going to uh, start with three adults as a proof of principle and safety leads in before we give, uh, uh, give it to the pediatrics there. It's going to be a single chemotherapy-based conditioning there, uh, and then we're going to look at the safety and efficacy there. And with that, um, I'm still going to work on the treadmill part. Uh, uh, so with that, I'm going to conclude. Uh, it's a huge group there that really helped, uh, Jan Nolta, uh, and their groups there is really instrumental there. The GMP facility, Dr. Anderson and their group there, uh, this is not Dr. Anderson, by the way. Um, their groups there are, uh, you know, again, those are the ones really did that. Our transplant groups are, are here, there, and this is UC Davis. Okay. Okay, great. So we do have some time. So I think what we'll do is we, I'll go up, I'll go up there, but I'm going to leave him up there. Don't worry. Um, just for some questions from the audience. We have a lot of pre-asked questions mm -hmm. um, for the panel, but I'm going to give you the, the spotlight for a moment like everyone else had. Um, so if anyone in the room wants to ask their questions. Hi, 
Hi, this is amazing. Um, assuming this works as we hope it does, if one of our children gets it, but in 20 years, your prodigies improve upon it and it gets even better, can it be rewiped out and put back in with the better technology? Uh, and the answer is yes. Remember number one, I, I didn't have a chance to go back to that backup product there. So we're going to store backup product on every patient there. Uh, and that backup products, let's just say, completely out of context here, there's, you know, we screw up, I screw up, and, and there's something wrong here. We can always replace it with the normal hematopoietic cells there and get rid of that clone there. So that's definitely there. Or then later also, as you said, coming with that. So I think that backup products will be, uh, will be very important, and we are seriously you know, considering to do that. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, the back of product can stay there for 20 years. Uh, I have myeloma patients that collected 20 years ago, and we have extra cells there, and I still use that uh, for if the disease is coming back, and we can use that. So, yes, that back of product can stay in the system for, for a long time. Hey, um, is it my turn? Okay. Um, you know, I, I think this is so exciting, and as a parent, I'm really, really, really excited about it, and I'll likely sign my son up for the clinical trial. Um, however, as a scientist, I'm really confused. I just don't understand how it works. I, I understand that the transplant carries the gene in, and in theory, the microglia cross or the macrophages and somehow they deliver the gene to the right place at the right time but I can't figure out how that is and I just wonder if there's any way to go ahead and do some of the uh, a little bit more on the rodents to do some slices and see if you can see the UB3A being expressed in the nucleus and and in the cytoplasm of neurons. So. Uh we are not, uh, that's actually, um, I can answer that in two different aspects there. Number one, what we really think is happening is that we are not transferring gene to neurons. We're just making these microglial cells, making these macrophages monocyte there to produce extra amount of enzymes. So that, that enzymes just work as a paracrine effect there and, uh, and, and correct the problems there. Uh, so that's, that's what we think. We, we're, not, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we're not saying that this is, this is going to transfer the gene into the neurons there. That's no. On the other hand, uh, I was doing these stem cell plasticities for many, many, many years. And back to your point, uh, we were trying to correct the problem in the muscle. Uh, the patient with muscular dystrophy, we were giving the stem cells, uh, hematopoietic stem cells, we transplanted that with the GFP gene and give it to the, uh, to the, to the mouse uh, that, you know, correcting the problem there. Uh, so the mouse was muscular dystrophy mouse. Uh, the cells were coming from a normal mouse. And we were seeing actually some interesting, you know, GFP in the muscle. Uh, so to your point, maybe, maybe there is something to that. And we know that some of the neurons, they are actually in incorporating some genes through microvesicles and other approaches there, okay? That's the, that's the topic of the research, that's, yeah. But our claim right now for all these other studies that was successfully done uh, for the same context there uh, is that this is just a transfer vehicle. It's a truck that takes the enzymes into the brain and stably and forever want to express that so now the brain cells can pick up the enzymes and hopefully get corrected. I'm just going to comment on that too, Terry Joe. Just if we can get Joe Anderson, guys in the back, can we get Joe up here too? Because he's gonna, he should be answering this question as well. Joe, the other guy, great. Um, but Terry Joe, just to to add to that, um, I think this is very similar in terms of there is some excretory or you know extra neuronal component here, just like Kevin Nash showed with sub versus stub, 
and also what the cross-correction approach is that Amicus is trying to develop, but there is a neuronal uptake tag. So they are mm -hmm. trying to penetrate into the neurons. Whether it gets in the nucleus or not, they are doing brain slices and they are staining mm -hmm. all of this. That is being done. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that, that it's very hard to determine exactly where it is, um, but they are actually doing that. So that data will be available. Um, the FDA doesn't require it necessarily because it, phenotypically it's, tremendous on what is seeing in terms of change. Um, but it's important scientifically to try to understand. And it could help the field so much to understand the fact that you may see major rescue outside the cell. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but, but it seems to be happening. So if Joe is up there, I'm sure he can answer that better than me. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yep. OK. Hi, Terry Joe. I thought that was you. I recognized your voice. Um, <laughs> But yeah, like Allison said, we are doing those experiments. Um, we're gonna look at co-localization of UBE3A in our treated mice with mouse neurons, and then we're also gonna look at um, human cell expression in separate sections of those mouse brains, and then look at UBE3A expression as well. So it won't you know, fully knock down the mechanism of what's happening, but it'll help to show UBE3A expression and the transfer into the neurons that uh, would typically not have it. That's great. So I have a, a bunch, if there's no one else in the room, I have a whole bunch online that I can ask you guys. You up on there? How would you go about giving treatment to a pediatric patient um, that's so active and moving, especially if they're um, a toddler, for instance? So. Okay, this is not the first time you're absolutely correct, uh, and that's always a challenge, and that's why I'm, I'm not a pediatrician, uh, <laughs> that, uh, but uh, it's routinely been done. So, you know, we are, you know, I just show you from a newborn to a toddler to, uh, to a teenager. Sometimes dealing with a teenager, believe me, is, is more difficult than dealing with a, with a, with a toddler. Uh, but there are multiple ways we do that. Um, you know, if the patient needs a procedure, obviously needs some sedations there, and that's routine. Uh, you know, every, every little procedure these days in the hospital, we do some sort of a sedations there. Uh, and then uh, from my understanding uh, 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 about the Angelman syndromes and talking with Allison, these patients respond very well to low dose of benzodiazepines like, you know, Ativan or something. So that can help as well a little bit, uh, calm them down as far as activity there. Uh, but it's something routinely being done. So it's uh, uh, this practice, all these, all these approaches to, for example, if you have a line here, how you can keep a line and a pediatric active, you know, patients not to pull the line out, okay? But, you know, there are multiple ways that uh, they're routinely doing in pediatric uh, populations there, and there are, it's, it's all uh, you know, routinely done. Mm -hmm. uh, hello. I'd like to go back to Joe and ask, is there any current data that the enzyme is getting into neurons? So not into neurons, but we have shown um, in collaboration with uh, Kyle Fink's lab that we do see UBE3A expression in the brains of our transplanted UBE3A deficient mice. And so we are seeing enzyme in the brain, and then we're currently working on optimizing the uh, co-localization with uh, fluorescent IHC to look at um, UBE3 in the actual mouse neurons. Okay, great. Now I'll, I'll ask one more and then we'll bring up the whole panel. Um, so this is from, from someone online. Um, let me just see which was this. Um, so you, you did a, a great job of explaining the, um, how HSC therapy would work in patients in terms of the conditioning regimen not being quite as strong as you would get with something like a malignancy or, or, or cancer, and how it's a, more of a soft regimen um, just to make some space for the stem cells to come in. And you also commented and answered this question about time in the hospital. Um, but how are you guys anticipating what you will do in order to ensure that patients during a period of a hospitalization for 10 days or more would be entertained and engaged, knowing our Angelman syndrome children um, require quite a bit of entertainment and engagement. Um, and how will that be managed with some of the isolation protocols for transplant when they're in an immunodeficient state? Will their parents be allowed to be with them? So I can answer the second part, and maybe I will leave that first part to you, uh, to Allison. Uh, uh, 
we used to, you know, I talk about bubble boy there, but you used to literally put the patients in a bubble for transplant. Uh, so the transplant patient, uh, especially allogeneic transplant patients, they become very immunodeficient. Uh, they were in the rooms there, and we were gunning up like a, you know, a space suit, uh, going to the room there, and, uh, and nobody was allowed to go there for 20 year, uh, days or something. That has completely changed. Now these days I go with my jacket, and uh, I put mask because of the COVID. Uh, but these patients, now, they are immunosuppressed to some extent, but they're not as bad as we thought. Most of the infections, if you do get an infection, is not coming from other people. It's coming because your mouth is full of bacteria, your gut is full of bacteria, and you get low white cell counts, and that bacteria find a way and cause a fever. Uh, so that, that has changed substantially. Uh, and uh, I told you, we just transplant these patients as our patients. So uh, they come every day in the clinic. There are a lot of other patients there in the clinic there. And they go home uh, or they go back to a hotel. There's a lot of patients, you know, people in the hotel there, for example, next to our transplant center. Uh, and they still do fine. Uh, so I'm not really concerned about that. Absolutely, we do want parent participation. Absolutely, we want it, you know, as long as they want, even for the cancer patients, the, you know, the loved ones can stay with the patients during the day, overnight. We provide beds and everything for them if you want to stay with them. Uh, so there's absolutely no problem there. And that concept of, uh, again, putting them in a bubble has completely changed now. Entertainment. Great. Entertainment. Well, I, I can't answer this question because I'm not part of this process, but <laughs> what I, would, I can give you some advice on how to entertain a patient with Angelman syndrome, certainly. Um, <laughs> and and I've, I've certainly given Joe plenty of advice on, on what um, I would recommend if it were a, a child with Angelman syndrome. But um, to your point, I, these patients aren't hooked up for days to an IV, right? So they have a catheter just to be assessed their blood every day or every few days, but ultimately they're able to run around. They just need to run around in an environment that's safe. They can't hit themselves because they might have low platelets, and we don't want them in an environment where they can get an easy infection. Um, so activity centers and, and sensory um, environments will have to be created in the clinical sites, I would imagine. Again, I'm not running this trial, so I can't tell you, but I would suggest that whoever does creates these types of sites so that our kids are in a place where there's padding and there's bouncy areas that are safe if they fall or move, but that they have toys and activities that they can be engaged for that period of time and lots of iPads with chargers and UB USB ports. That's, that's what I would recommend. That's why I asked her to answer that. Uh, the reality, again, again, the concepts are different. Uh, I, I want to change that concept. These patients are not going to be bed bound like somebody's with the bat, you know, sick in the hospital there. Uh, even our 70 years old, 80 years old transplant patients, we bring exercise back in the room, we ask them to exercise every day. So they're there not because they're very sick, they're there and they're bored, uh, you know, and uh, just, just want to make sure we understand that. We keep them there just to observe them if they happen to get sick, because if they have a fever, then I have to treat them right away. I don't want to send them to the ER and, you know, four hours later, somebody say hello. But they're not supposed to be there and sick all the time. And, you know, entertainment is absolutely, I think, critical there. And we'll work with the, I think that's what I was trying to mean. I need the feedback from you guys that deal with that every single day how to entertain them, and I really appreciate that in input. And, and that's where parent advisory boards are really helpful. Mm -hmm. So every company that has a clinical trial either about to happen or already started have done parent advisory boards where they invite the community um, to really give ideas and, and input. And I know I was invited to some to give my ideas of what it would take for my child. So I assume that that we would it, there would be some call for people to, to join this and, and give their input, which will be very we helpful. We definitely welcome that. Sponsors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Why don't we call up the panels? Oh, you have another question back there? Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Um, with a neurodevelopmental disorder such as this, have you guys contemplated the issues of, obviously common sense would argue the earlier this can be done, the better the symptoms for Angelman, in utero versus early postnatal transplantation? Uh, we do have in utero programs for other disease. Uh, uh, we haven't looked at this for these particular situations there. Uh, but my understanding is that, at least understanding from other neurodegenerative disorders there, is that we may not even need that. It looks like with the, the data on the newborn suggests that 
for most of these things. If you get, there's a lot of flexibility at the very beginning, in the first probably six months to a year. And again, I'm not an expert on that by any mean, uh, but uh, you know, 80 years old, you get a stroke, you get a stroke, you're never going to get rid of that. Uh, you know, much younger people, they have some flexibility there. So whether we need that in utero versus, uh, you know, newborn versus early childhood is something to find out. Right now, we just want to show the proof of principle. And it's important to remember, and Joe can speak to his data, but the, in the data, they did newborn and they did adult mm -hmm. mouse, and they had full rescue both mm -hmm. ages. So humans will tell us. <laughs>